All right, we are still in our study of the book of Hebrews. Um, I'll give you a very brief recap. We have quite a bit to cover today. Uh, but the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew believers uh, who were being pretty heavily persecuted. And their per- persecution was a little different because it wasn't just from the pagans or the Romans. Uh, it was also from other Jews. Uh, that was actually probably the, the bulk of it was from other Jews uh, because they wanted them to mix the grace experience with keeping certain articles of the law, which obviously you can't do uh, because the law was designed to point to the grace covenant. So uh, they were under a lot of pressure to do that, but they knew if they would, if they would make that compromise, it would put them in discipline with God. So it made for a really tough and uncomfortable situation. Now, the writer wrote this letter uh, hoping to encourage them to stay the course and, and telling them it would be worth it. So I titled today's message, Listen Carefully, because all the parties involved in God's plan have certain responsibilities. Okay, it's God's responsibility to speak to us through his word. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility who indwells us at the moment of faith uh, to interpret God's word and his will to us. And it's our responsibility to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to obey it. Uh, and today, this is pretty much the main topic throughout the rest of this today. And we're going to be jumping from here to the Old Testament. So let's jump on in. It's Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And he says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, uh, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. And I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, the author is really continuing a theme theme that we've been seeing throughout this whole book, which is focus on Jesus and and listen carefully to what Jesus has to say. Now, to drive this point home, he uses a really smart illustration. One thing the Jews understood, one thing they were very familiar with, was all the stories from the Bible. They knew those stories. They were raised with them. Uh, They were very familiar with the law, even from a very young age. So he knew if he used an illustration they were familiar with from the Old Testament that it might sink in a little bit. So he reminded them of the disobedience and the consequences of the wilderness generation, is what it's called, the wilderness generation. And the wilderness generation just refers to the Israelites that Moses led out of Egypt. That's all it's talking about. Now, the author even quotes Psalm 95 throughout these passages uh, because it kind of recounted their rebellion against God. And he did that to remind them that God never has and never will tolerate disobedience. He just never has and he never will, especially when the catalyst of that disobedience is a lack of faith. That's something God just can't put up with. Now, obviously, God won't take a believer's salvation, but he will discipline them, and they found that out. But what did he mean when he said uh, in verse 11, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter what? My rest. rest. Now, entering God's rest back then uh, was referring to the promised land. Now, God promised Moses a land that flowed with milk and honey, a place with great agricultural resources, and he said that they could have that, okay? He promised them that land. So the rest, they looked at that being their place of rest. They came out of bondage into their own land where it had all these resources and they could rest. That was entering their rest. Uh, Again, this was a foreshadowing. We see so much of that in the Old Testament, but this is a foreshadowing of better things to come, better things that the Messiah would actually uh, usher in because Believers who refuse to trust and obey God today still don't enter into God's rest, right? The difference being God's rest back then was talking about this promised land, but it was giving us a glimpse into the future because in the future, those who are disobedient wouldn't be able to enter into the promised kingdom, which is supposed to be our place of rest where we get to rest and and reign with Jesus as he reigns the world for a thousand years. So it's the same concept and it was pointing to that. Okay, that was all designed to let us get a, a, like a foreshadowing of that. And I think when you understand that situation, it helps what we're about to read make a little more sense. Okay, now the situation he's reminding them about is Moses and the Israelites at a place called Kadesh Barnea. Okay, so look at Numbers 13.1. I'm going to try to behave myself because I could preach on this forever. But it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourselves men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going, listen, It says, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. Uh, You shall send a man from each of his father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran uh, at the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. 
Now, the wilderness generation made it all the way to the border of the promised land. A lot of times we don't realize this, but when they wandered around for 40 years, the, the promised land was right there. I mean, it's, it's not like they were hundreds of miles away. They were, it was right there, but their disobedience was keeping them from entering it. But they were right at the border uh, of the promised land. And God clearly said, I'm going to give you this land. It's just as clear as it can be. I'm going to give this land to the children of Israel. So God told Moses to send 12 spies into the promised land to check it out. Now, here's the thing. The reason God did that was for tactical reasons, not because he questioned whether he had the ability to actually deliver them. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying, well, I'm going to give you the land, but you better check and see how tough they are just in case I'm sending the wrong people. That's not what he was saying. He was saying just for tactical reasons, go look at the land you're about to take. That's what he was telling them. Now, here's the thing you have to remember. God never calls us to do anything that he hasn't uh, empowered us to do successfully. If God calls you to do something, he's already made the path straight. He's already worked at one side and the end. It's all worked out for you. Our job is just to follow that path because it will lead to success if he's called you to it. He never calls you to do something you can't do, okay? God would never call me to be a worship leader. <laughs> and don't make me show you why. Because a few bars of any song and I will clear this room. I'm just telling you. But... God didn't call me to do that. What he called me to do, he was going to empower me to do. If he's calling you to do something, he's going to empower you to do that. All right? It's really important that you understand that. So if we allow fear and doubt to make us question that calling, it's actually sin. And it's sin because what you're questioning when you question God's calling is his sovereignty. You're saying, God, I know you called me to do this, but I know better than you. I can't do that. Now, you might think I can, but God, you're wrong. I know me better than you. That's what you're saying when you allow fear and doubt to keep you from carrying out what he's called you to do. But despite all God had done for these people, this is what kills me. They were questioning whether he would give them the land. Okay, and we'll see that here in a minute. But despite all he had done for them, this wilderness generation would not stop doubting him. Now, remember all the things they experienced to be delivered from Egypt. Okay, we're talking... Plagues of frogs and all these plagues, these miraculous plagues, and, and the rivers turned to blood. I mean, he did some things that, you know, were not parlor tricks, David Copperfield type stuff. We're talking miracles. They got to witness it. They were let go because of these miracles, yet they still doubted him. So the author of Hebrews here wanted his readers to see the correlation here. And the correlation was between the doubts they were having and the doubts that the children in the wilderness generation were having. He was saying, you're doubting just like they doubted. Basically, you know what happened to them. Does that sound good to you? Because you're doing the same thing that got them put in discipline. What do you think is going to happen to you? Because when the 12 spies returned, he sent 12 spies. When they returned, 10 of those spies said, forget it. We're just not strong enough. We are just not strong enough. we got to get out of there. That's what they were saying. Now look at this, Numbers 13, 25 through 33. It says, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. Uh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Now some historians say that the fruit was so big that grapes were like that. Wouldn't that be awesome? I could still eat a whole vine on them. I love grapes. But they were saying, he was, they were showing them God was right. Now, you're going to find how ironic this is. They're saying everything he said about the, about the resources was dead on. And here's evidence of it. Verse 28, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, which were, they were supposed to be giant people, large people, like, you know, really big. I was going to tell you how tall, but that's been debated so long, I'm not going to. Just a lot bigger than me. Let's put it that way. But um, verse 29, and Amalek is living in the land uh, of Negev, the, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. 
Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Why, or said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land uh, through which we have gone in spying out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. They, uh, there uh, also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, uh, were part of the Nephilim, again, the giants, uh, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So 10 of the 12 spies come back, and the first thing they do, which everybody should have picked up on this, the first thing they do is say, you know what? Everything God said about that place is true. I mean, it's amazing. It's got such resources, and look at the size of the fruit that come off. This is just fruit that's growing there. I mean, God was absolutely right. It is an amazing land, but there's always a but, is there? But. They saw the inhabitants of the land, and they saw that they were large, and they were intimidating, and they said they're just too powerful for us to defeat. But there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who totally disagreed. And the reason was they knew that if God said they could take the land, they could take it. They knew that. If God said they could take the land, then they could take it. And the, the problem was the differing perceptions or, or perspectives before the spies ever left. They left with different perspectives. Okay, because the 10 of the 12 spies were surveying and spying to see if it were possible for them to do what God told them to do. So they started off in doubt. They didn't grow that doubt. They started off looking for a reason to not go. Have you ever done that with a project or something where you're like, you know, guys, your wife says, listen, I want you to build this fence. And you're like, well, let me go see if it's possible. And you're out there going, God, show me anything to keep me from building this fence. <laughs> I mean, I've never done it. I've heard of people <laughs> who have done that. You know, that's how the, the 10 of the first 12 spies were looking at the land. They're like, as soon as they saw big people and, and fortified cities, they're like, okay, let's find a reason to not attack these people. They are huge, right? But Joshua and Caleb, they were surveying to see how and when they would take the land. They weren't walking in there saying, I hope we can take the land. They were walking in there going, man, I can't wait to take this spot. They were so confident. I'll bet they were house shopping. I do. I'll, I'll bet you they had already called the local realtor, and they were looking around houses. They fully believed that they saw the possibilities, they saw the resources, and they knew they could take that. And 45 years later, which I, you know, I don't have time to cover all that time, but 45 years later when they finally entered the promised land, so you can see that this didn't go well by that a line right there, you see the same attitude in Caleb. Because 45 years, listen what happens when he comes into the promised land. This is in uh, Joshua 14, 10. It says, Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke uh, these 45 years from the time that the Lord spoke his word to Moses when Israel walked into the wilderness. And now, behold, I am 85 years old today. Listen to this. Th this is such an old guy statement. Verse 11. I am still... <laughs> As strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now uh, for war and for going out and coming in. <laughs> this reminds me of my dad. My dad's 85 years old, 86, 87, in the 80s. At that point, it doesn't matter, right? And every time we, I talk trash to him, he goes, son, the last person to whoop me was my mother. He always says that. <laughs> I'm like, because she's the last one who tried. No, but anyway... Um, it just sounds like an old guy thing to say. Verse 12, uh, now then, listen to this. It says, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard uh, on that day that uh, Anakim were there uh, with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son uh, of Jephna, for his inheritance. Now, this is funny. So he remembered the entire time, 45 years, what area he wanted to live in. That shows you the perspective he had. He went in there going, this is awesome. Where am I going to live? I better put my stakes down, right? And then he remembered that hill country. So when they finally got to go in, the first thing he says is, oh, I remember this little spot. 
right? The hill country. And, and Joshua gave him the hill country. It's kind of neat. So Joshua and Caleb knew what God had promised, and they knew that he was going to deliver it no matter what the optics. And optics get us in trouble. I'll explain that here in a minute. See, the ten faithless spies, all they were doing was revealing just all the disbelief that was already existing among the Israelites. They were uh, representatives of a nation that doubted God. If they would have picked any other 10 men, they would have come back with the same report. I believe that. Because they were showing how those people had doubt uh, all through them about anything God was telling them. Uh, The 10 spies, they had faith as long as their faith didn't contradict their apparent circumstances. It doesn't take faith to believe something simple. It doesn't take faith to do that. Faith is evidence of things unseen. When God tells you something, faith says, I believe it even though I don't see it. I don't have to see it because God, you said it, right? That's that's how Joshua and Caleb were. Now, what happened next is what God's talking about when he said, you know, don't harden your hearts if you hear his voice as in the day when they provoked me. It's in Numbers 14, 1 through 10. It says, then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. You know what they were crying about? Because the ten spies said, it's everything God said, but we're just not tough enough. They were crying over that. Big, stinking babies. Verse 2, all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it, uh, would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Do they forget what Egypt was like? You know, it said it would be better if we just returned to Egypt, right? Verse 4. So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell, uh, fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly and all the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, uh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which uh, we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be what? I pray. You see a difference there? We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And Joshua and Caleb going, oh, no. They're the prey. We're the hunters. Make no mistake, right? So they would be like prey. Uh, Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. (laughs) That reminds me of today. You bring truth and good news today, people want to kill you. Tell them a lie, and they love you. Tell them a lie, and they, you know, elect you. Anyway. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. Now, the Israelites did what people who struggle with trusting God always do, okay? Because because of fear, they settled for less than God promised and less than God wanted for them. Fear and doubt will always make you settle. It will always make you settle. I mean, some even made it sound like Moses came to Egypt and removed them from a sandals resort. You know, oh, it was so lovely in Egypt, It was terrible. They cried out to God day and night for 400 years. They cried out to God, get us out of here. And now they're saying, I don't know, it was really that bad. You know, I mean, these guys give us a scary report. I would rather go back to what I know is terrible than take a chance on trusting God. It's unbelievable the lack lack of faith they had. And the problem with a lack of faith is that it causes people to have short memories just like that. Have you ever done that? God can do so many good things for you. One thing doesn't go your way and your memory disappears. You ever notice that? Why, God, why don't you ever do anything good for me? Anybody ever say that while you're sucking wind in that he's giving you? You know, why, God, why is this country so terrible? And he puts it to your mind, there's some countries I could send it to that make you think you're living in a resort, right? We have very short memories. They forget that for 400 years, they beat them. They murdered their children to keep the population in check. They worked them in the hot sun 12, 16 hours a day. As long as it was daylight, they worked all day long. Never let them advance. It was slavery. Right? I mean, they, and then they forgot also all the things that God did to set them free. They forgot all the miracles. They forgot how someone who was in the palace came back and became their champion. That alone should have showed them the power of God. And then you had all the miracles and all the plagues that he sent. They forgot all about that. And because of their evil and unbelieving hearts, 
they were willing to settle for slavery. A lack of faith made them willing to settle for slavery. Okay, when believers today allow fear and doubt to hinder them, we also are settling for slavery. Right? Listen to this, 2 Peter 19, or 2, 19, just the second part there, B. For you are a slave to... You can answer that. Is it on up there? <laughs> Read right there. No, just kidding. <laughs> you are a slave to whatever controls you. To whatever controls you. Now, if what people think about you hinders your faith, then you're a slave to those people. If you're all worried about making sure that everybody in the world loves you and thinks so highly of you, and then you're their slave. They own you. Okay? Here's some other things. Uh, if work or the pursuit of wealth hinders your faith, then you're a slave to work and the pursuit of wealth. It owns you, right? And the same is true with relationships. The same is true with religious tradition, drugs, alcohol, etc. All those things. Every one of those things, if it hinders your faith, you're a slave to it. You're stuck with it. So believers who are willing to settle will only read about the amazing things that God does rather than experiencing them for themselves because their lack of faith has conned them into settling for less. I can't tell you how many times I see people who have decided it's easier to settle for less, but that's just because you've never trusted God enough to experience the joy of letting him work through you. Because once you experience that, you'll realize that your, faith, your lack of faith was, was keeping you from realizing God's best. Now, let's move on. Uh, Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. It says, Take care, brethren, that there not be any of you uh, an evil, or there not be in any, of, any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened, you might want to underscore this, hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast uh, the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Now that partakers of Christ that he's talking about is being a partaker of Christ's blessings, being able to serve in the kingdom. You're partaking in the ministry of Christ. Right? Uh, verse 15. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Now the Israelites provoked God by not trusting his, you know, in the promises that he made and allowing their own fears and doubt to push them away from God. Now, eventually, the fear and unbelief of the Israelites turned into anger and rebellion, and that's really normal. That's really kind of normal. That's why the author told the Hebrews to encourage each other, because he knew that when we surrender to fear over faith, when we do that, we are surrendering to sin. We are surrendering to sin. Because again, it is a sin to doubt God and to doubt God's promises. It's just a sin. And once we surrender to it, once you surrender to sin, it doesn't just lay dormant inside you, okay? It starts hardening you. Anybody ever have that happen to them where something pulled you away from God, whatever the case may be, a relationship or a job or someone hurt your feelings, you know, or something like that, and it pulls you away from God, that sin that pulled you away from God will start churning inside you, and you start getting harder and more angry and more negative. It just starts taking you over once it's inside you. And before long, anger and bitterness and resentment just take over, and you start to fall away from God. Here's some of the things that starts happening. You stop going to church. I have never understood that. I, I just don't get it. If someone hurts your feelings, change your diaper and go talk to them. You really are going to stop a command of God? God commanded us to gather together and worship. You're not going to do that because your feelings are hurt. <laughs> Poor thing. Let me get you some A&D ointment, right? <laughs> stop coming to church. Why do we do that? You're like, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to stop coming to church. Oh, yeah, you've taught them. You know? Yeah, that's not going to hurt them one bit. You're not hurting them one bit, right? Here's another thing. We stop reading. You know why I think a lot of us stop reading when we're angry at God or angry at someone in the family of God? Because we know when we read, it's going to tell us we're a big baby. And you're going to turn to 2 Chris chapter 2, and it says, do you want some A&D ointment? It's going to say that <laughs> if it were in there. But every time you open up the Bible and start reading, when you're in that situation, it's going to point out everything you had to do with it. Anybody ever notice that? I even tried to turn to books before when I'm mad at somebody that I thought would be innocent enough to not point me out. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh gosh, let me see, what can I turn to? Let me turn to 2 Chronicles where it says, was the son of, was the son of, was the son of for, you know, 10, 9 chapters, 10 chapters. But not when Chris opens it. I open it up and it says, yeah, you're wrong, call him. That's what it always says to me. <laughs> you know, that's why they don't want to read anymore. They know the word of God's going to point out the sin in their life, right? They stop praying. Because sometimes I think when we, 
you know, refuse to repent, and we allow that anger to well up inside us, praying seems pretty futile, doesn't it? Because you start praying. Anybody ever start praying and feel like nobody's home on the other end of the line? Anybody ever pray that way? Oh, they're there. You just haven't said anything he wants to answer to yet. Because the first thing God wants to hear from you before he tells you anything is, I'm sorry, you're right and I'm wrong. I sin. I let my pride take over. I argue with that person. Now I'm not going to church. I'm not reading. I'm not. It's my fault, God. I'm the baby. Show me how to make this right. Then all of a sudden prayer will open up to you again. Right? Then the lid comes off, if you will, and you can start talking to God again. Here's another thing that happens. We stop looking like believers and start looking like the world. I have known people who got out of the will of God. I think they were still believers. Once you're saved, you're always saved. But something happened to them, and so they get angry at God. And then years later, they go, yeah, I got saved back then. And you're thinking, I never knew. Because something had drove them away from God, and now... The Bible says there are those who have forgotten they were once purged of their old sins. That's how bad it can get. And that person is not living a blessed life. Promise me. I promise you that. Now, um, but when all that happens, I mean, we start to become like the Israelites in the desert. We're useless for God. When we're in that situation, we're just useless for God. And being useless for God is not a place where I want to stay very long. You know what I mean? Because that's a dark and lonely place. And as we'll soon see, disbelief and rebellion cost, especially these faithless ones, everything. And it always does. Now let's move on to verse 16 through 19 in Hebrews. It says, For who provoked him when they, heard, uh, when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. All right, now the writer of Hebrews is starting to tie it together, okay? The only thing the Israelites' unbelief and rebellion gained them was God's discipline. That's it. You know, standing against God because you're mad, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but you can't win, okay? You're never going to beat God in an argument. You're never going to beat him in a debate. You're never going to say, God, I think you're wrong, and him go, you know what, I, you know, I am. You're right. That's never going to happen. It never profits you to stand against God, ever. I don't care what the reason, it doesn't profit you. If you want to run off and be a baby and quit reading and praying and quit going to church, you're going to show everybody because you're done with God. It's not going to end well for you. You know, you, you could have your 40 years in the desert. Right? Because he's certainly not going to bless you or advance you. He's just not going to do it. Right? The only thing that got them was discipline. Look at verse 11 and 12. Numbers 14, 11 and 12. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? I will smite them with pestilence and, and dispossess them, and I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. So God basically told Moses, I'm done. I am done with these people. How dumb can you be? I mean, look at them. This is the Chris Mosley version, by the way, but I'm just saying, how dumb can you be? You saw the miracles that I did to get you out of Egypt. And then when you were walking in the desert, it rained bread. Not a normal media, you know, something you see in meteorology. When it rains bread, that's God. I made it rain bread for them. When they cried because they didn't have meat, I made the quails fly into their camp. I have done everything for them. I led them by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. And every time something goes wrong, they try me. He's like, you know what? I'm done with them. I'm just going to dispossess them. I'm just going to poof. And I will start a new nation with you being the foundation, since you're the only one that actually listened. That's what he was saying. But Moses pleaded for them. And became their only advocate. People always say, why did he do that? Have you ever had the one kid? Jeremy, you don't have to look at her. (laughs) Have you ever had the one kid that you're going to stick up for him no matter what happens, but after a while you're thinking, are they ever going to learn? But when it comes time, you still stand up for him because you hope that they will. This is kind of how Moses felt about them. He's like, yeah, I know they're trash. But you know what? I brought them this far. I really think, listen to what he says, Numbers 14, 13. said, but Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it, for by your strength you brought 
up this people out of their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slay this people as one man, then the nation who have heard of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, if you do that, all these pagans are going to say, yeah, God was tough enough to pull them out, not tough enough to get them through. He couldn't finish, right? Great starter, bad finisher. That's what they were going to say about that, right? It says, verse 17, uh, but now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have uh, declared. Uh, the Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity uh, and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness, just as you have also forgiven this people uh, from Egypt even until now. Now, you might think, a lot of people say, well, see, God does change his mind. When God does something like that, he's seeing what you're going to do. Not because he doesn't know what you're going to do. He wants you to know what you're capable of. Here's my theory, okay? So this is just the Chris Mosley theory. I think God heard Moses. You know Moses was getting ticked at him. He was a man. I mean, if you read through there, there's one time where Moses comes in and says, what, why'd you do this to me, God? Why, I mean, do I have to be a nursemaid to all these? And he was always mad at him because they were, I mean, he goes up the mountain to get the law. He comes down and they have a golden calf. And he looks at his brother and he's like, uh, <laughs> there's a golden calf. And I love Aaron's, I love what Aaron says. He goes, well, we just took all the earrings and nose rings and all the stuff, which, by the way, men wore back then. Anyway, <laughs> he took all the earrings and all the gold, and we threw it in the fire, and a cow came out, which was a lie. They had to form that cow, right? So Moses, you know Moses got ticked at him, and I know there were times Moses thought to himself, I just want to quit. I'm done. God wanted to give him the opportunity to know that he really did love those people. And down deep under all the stupidity he had to put up with, he still wanted the best for his people. And sometimes we forget how much we love someone until there's a chance we might lose them. And then that love comes to the surface. I think that he was saying, I should just get rid of him, Moses. What do you think? I mean, you know how many times they've stuck you in the back. You know how many times they've made your life miserable. I think I'll just destroy all of them. Moses like, wait, 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 wait. Maybe I complained a little too much. I do love those people. I believe that's why God allowed this to happen. But we do see a foreshadowing of better things to come here too because Moses became Israel's advocate with the Father. Who is our advocate with the Father? Jesus, this is a picture of Jesus in Moses. Moses advocated for a generation that deserved to be wiped out because he loved them. Jesus advocates for us, and we deserve to be wiped out because he loves us. 2 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he says that because no one cannot sin, okay? And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The whole world. Ooh, that's tempting to go off on that for a while, but I won't. Now, because Moses, like Jesus, was advocating for you know, the people, God graciously pardoned him. The reason God pardons our sin is not because we deserve it. God doesn't pardon our sin because he's like, you know, Jake, you're just so righteous that I can't stand the thought of you not being in heaven with me. That's not what it is. No, he's going, Jake, you're an idiot. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't have a chance. Sorry, front row, dude, close enough. But that's what it is. When I get to heaven, he's not going to go, Chris, we've been waiting for you. We're going to retire your jersey in the rafters of heaven. He's going to say, boy, you got in by the skin of your teeth, didn't you? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, there was no chance you would make it in, right? God generously pardons those people 
that Jesus advocated for. And this is exactly the picture that Moses was drawing here. If you look at Numbers 14, 20. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word, but indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurn me see it. But my servant uh, Caleb, because he has had uh, a different spirit and followed me fully, I will bring into the land which uh, he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. So God basically said, I'm going to spare their lives, Moses. I'm going to spare their lives. But I am not going to let them enter my rest. They're not going, the closest they're going to get to the promised lands, they're going to see it. That's the closest they're going to get. Because you know what? They've doubted me these 10 times. They, they constantly, constantly turn their backs on me no matter what I do for them. So in response to that, I'm not going to let Egyptian come, the Egyptians come take them, but they will all die in this desert. And I will give that land to their children and to Caleb. Caleb will live long enough past all of them to where he can see it. Joshua and Caleb will see it. But none of that generation will see it. So only their children were allowed to see the promised land. Again, we're talking about a foreshadowing of the kingdom. There are going to be believers who, you know what? He's got to keep his promise. He said, those who believe have eternal life. You're going to have eternal life. Are you going to serve in the kingdom? I can't let you. Your whole life you made excuses as to why you had something better to do than serve me. Why you had something better to do than be faithful to me. Why you put everything else in the world before me. And I can't reward that by letting you reign with Christ. Now, you can be there and you can watch, but you're going to ride the pine. Again, Chris Mosley version, right? So only Joshua and Caleb were allowed to see it uh, and the children of the people who doubted him. See, here's the thing. The enemy never tells the whole story when he whispers temptations in our ear. He just never tells the whole story, right? When he tells us not to forgive somebody or to stop going to church or to, you know, oh, I know that needs done. Let somebody else do it. When he whispers those things in our ear, he doesn't tell us the consequences for those things. And I'll give you some examples. When he says, you know what, you don't need to forgive them. How many people have you ever heard somebody, and I love it when people say that because they have such you know, ignorant conviction. When they go, that's it, I'm done with them. You hear people say that and you're going, are you now? I don't care, I'm not forgiving them, I am done with them. And I'm thinking, you're probably gonna because you're not going to like the situation you're in until you do. Right? Right? Here's what Jesus said about that. Matthew 6, 14. He says, For if you, get, you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. The enemy doesn't whisper that in your ear when he's saying, Be done with him. He's not telling you that's not gracious like the God who saved you. Aren't you glad the God who saved you didn't do that? That's, he doesn't tell you that part of it. Skipping church, when, the, when you get angry and the devil whispers, we'll show them. We'll just quit going to church. Here's what he doesn't tell you. It may start as a, as a whining protest, but it'll, you know, it may be a protest born out of anger and resentment, but it ends up becoming a habitual attitude of disobedience that absolutely hinders any blessing God would have put in your life. Right? He don't tell you that. Look at Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. He says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling, assembling together. The word church means assembly, okay, assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging, see that, as is the habit, it does become a habit, trust me, right? It says, as is the habit, uh, where'd it go? as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Now, when we allow fear to keep us from serving God, which happens, you know, it leads to us conforming to the world and being less like God. The enemy doesn't tell you that, that you're going to destroy your testimony. It doesn't tell you that. Look at this, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but, <laughs> but transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Now, just to tie this all together, I mean, the more we look and sound like the world, the less we look and sound like Jesus, and the less we look and sound like Jesus, the more we are like the children who are in the desert that he talked about in Moses' time. We're never going to reach the blessings that God has for us. This is what he wanted the Hebrews to take from this. Hey, you know what happened to him. You're on the path to be the same. And that's the same lesson he's given us. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We'll pick up there next week. If you would, please bow your heads. Actually, next week's Easter, isn't it? We shall not pick up there next week. While every head is bowed, if there's anyone here that would like me to pray for him, just make eye contact. Bless those people. Put your head right back down. Bless those people. If you're watching or listening online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you. Um, believers, I'm telling you, as we get close to celebrating the resurrection, every year I think, wouldn't this be a great time to resurrect the passion in us that once existed? To start serving God the way he deserves to be served in us? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for their love and mercy. I'm so excited, God. I love celebrating Easter because it reminds us that someday we will defeat death, hell, and the grave too. We've already got the victory. I just can't wait someday to experience it. I thank you, Lord, for the love and especially the grace because none of us would have anything if it wasn't for your son, Jesus. None of us can do anything to deserve it. We can't become good enough. We have nothing to trade or exchange. All we can do is believe in the work that Jesus did and trust that it was enough to guarantee our eternal life. And if we can do that, he promised to give it to us. And if anyone makes that decision, I would love to walk with them in that journey. We just pray that they would contact us. But Lord, for those of us who are believers, let this season remind us that there is a different person inside of us than what the world is trying to make us into. That person that was so excited to hear the truth and believe it is still in there. Give us a passion to let them out. Let us be the kind of testimonies that draw people to you. When people hear us, let them hear you. We just thank you, God, for all that you do, and we ask you to keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, let us come together and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.